Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Britt Cloudsdale. I'm the Adopt US Kids uh, Pro, uh, Family Support Program Manager, and I'm pleased to have with me Barb Clark and Kim Stevens of the North American Council on Adoptable Children. Um, they are here to uh, talk with us about a pretty timely subject, facilitating virtual support groups. Um, we, a lot of us have had to uh, move quickly and put our um, in-person groups, in-person support groups into virtual spaces, so we're really excited to have both of these um, very experienced um, adoptive uh, parents and parent group leaders and experienced trainers join us today. So before we begin, I just wanted to let you all know um, that this webinar is being recorded and it's going to be posted publicly on the Adopt US Kids website for professionals, which is professionals.adoptuskids.org. And I'll make sure that you have that in the chat here in just a moment. Um, your lines will be muted throughout the entire webinar, um, but you can, and we hope that you do, submit questions via the questions pod in your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, that is also where you can touch base with us if you're having any technical issues, if you're having trouble hearing or anything like that, please do type into the questions pod. Um, and we also hope that you will complete a survey that comes at the end of the webinar. You'll be receiving that, e uh, that survey through your email from Adopt US Kids Evaluation. We very, very much um, uh, respond to folks' feedback. We love feedback. We really need you to um, let us know if we're developing things that are meeting your needs. And if we're not, we want to hear about it so that we can do better. So we really hope you'll take five minutes to just complete that survey when you get that in your email. And we appreciate that so much. Um, so before we get started with Barb and Kim, I'm just going to let you know a little bit about Adopt US Kids. Um, Adopt US Kids is a project of the US Children's Bureau with two-pronged mission. Uh, our first part of our mission is to raise public awareness about the need for foster and adoptive families for children in the public child welfare system. And we also assist states, territories, and tribes um, in the recruitment, engagement, development, and support of foster and adoptive families. And so this webinar falls into the second half of that mission. Um, we do this in a variety of different ways. Um, we have a national adoption and foster care information exchange system where uh, prospective foster and adoptive families can call and get relevant information and get connected with their appropriate jurisdiction. We also have a national photo listing service that features over 5,000 children and teens who are waiting to be adopted. And you may be also familiar with our national adoption recruitment campaign, which had the most recent tagline of you can't imagine the reward. Uh, we also have a capacity building and engagement team that um, provides uh, tailored capacity building and any systems specific assistance, which is, you know, say that three times fast. Um, and that's for any um, any uh, state, territory, or tribe that is uh, in need of any support within the scope of our mission. Uh, we also have a, a family support team of which I'm a part of, and we um, uh, provide webinars like this, as well as lots of other resources, tools, written materials, articles, and we do um, uh, lots of trainings and other capacity building events to help encourage the um, implementation or improvement of uh, support um, development and support resources for foster and adoptive families. Um, and last but not least, we also have a minority professional leadership development uh, program, which is for uh, leaders and emerging leaders of color in the adoption field. And we're really excited about the um, kickoff of the third cohort of that uh, program. It's been really, really exciting to see what they, um, what those fellows come up with. So, um, and so with that, I'd like to start uh, by talking about our goals for the webinar. Um, we really um, hope that this will be an interactive conversation as much as we can within the confines of, of this platform. You know, we're talking about how to engage folks in a virtual space. It's hard, um, and so we. But please do, um, you know, to type into chat as best you can. Type in, type your questions into the questions pod. Um, but we're going to discuss um, what effective facilitation looks like, um, both of parent support groups generally, and also um, in a virtual setting. Of what kind of additions that you need to be thinking about in a virtual setting. Um, and we're also going to share some concrete strategies for you to help improve the engagement in your online groups. Um, and so with that, um, before I hand it off to Barb and Clark, I just want to do a quick poll here so that we all can know who all is um, uh, here and in the room and what your experience level is um, with um, 
with support groups, with virtual support groups? Have you facilitated virtual support groups before? Um, so um, please check one if you have no experience facilitating virtual groups, if you have some experience facilitating virtual groups, and or if you have a lot of experience with it. Um, we're, uh, of course, everybody's welcome, and we're excited for anybody who's coming here to learn new things, regardless of your level of experience. Um, and I know that some of these categories are pretty subjective here, so just pick the one that seems to fit best for you. It looks like y'all are awesome and have already, most of you have already voted. So I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and share it. So most of you fall in somewhere in the middle, picking that middle, <laughs> that middle option there, as I would as well. A lot of people are probably, um, you know, since the start of COVID, have probably already been doing some virtual groups, but maybe not as many as, or as many as they were thinking they were going to do at the beginning of all of this. Maybe thinking that was a skill they didn't necessarily need to hone, and now it looks like it's maybe here to stay. So I'm excited to have all of you here. And um, with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Barb and Kim. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, Britt. It's exciting to see that so many of you have had some experience. Um, I think for me, the hardest thing was the first time I tried to do something like this. And knowing that you've already had some experience is really gonna help, um, I think, in really growing your abilities. So first thing I'm wondering if you could all do is just type into the question box what challenges you have been experiencing. Um, you may be thinking about personality challenges. You may be thinking about technical challenges, um, maybe something around engagement. But we really want to hear from you what your challenges have been so that Barb and I can address them as best we can and make sure that we're really hitting what you all need. Boy, Kip, they're they're flying in fast. Several folks talking about how they have trouble with engagement and keeping folks engaged, mm -hmm. um, and of participation generally um, during groups. Um, how to respond to body language in this you know kind of flat environment that in a virtual setting that's really challenging. Um, mm -hmm. Differing levels of technical knowledge and how to you know do some troubleshooting with those folks who don't really have a lot of of experience in that area with technology. Um, lots of folks sharing low turnout, low participation. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of engagement here. Um, getting families to engage in a private way, um, right? Mm -hmm. We're all around lots of different um, folks and including the children that we're talking about and wanting to respect right. everybody's privacy. Right. Yeah, those are actually the same things that I think Barb and I encounter all the time. We just had a virtual conference that lasted for four days and a lot of those issues were what came up for us too. So we're going to hopefully address some of those concerns, come up with some good strategies for you, but keep um, communicating with us in the question box and in the chat box. And if we say something that doesn't seem like it would work for you, push back and let's see if we can dig deeper. Yeah, and just really quick, um, Kim and I both work at the North American Council on Adoptable Children, otherwise known as NACAC. And, um, um, I am an adoptive parent. I live in Minnesota, and um, I, my kids are all teenagers and emerging young adults um, currently, and I'm really excited to be here. And I'll let you all know that I am also an adoptive parent. I've got two, my husband and I have two birth sons and four kids that were adopted from the Massachusetts system, but all of our kids are grown now and still very much part of our family and bring us lots and lots of joy. So there's light at the end, yay. Anyway, first of all, we wanna talk about establishing those group agreements. And what we have found is that a lot of times when groups are struggling, it was because they either did not establish those agreements in the beginning, or they didn't establish them together in the, uh, in the beginning. And I think it's really important, especially now that we're in this virtual world, it's so very important that the members of your group feel like they have a say in how things are being run, feel like um, their needs and their concerns are being addressed, and feel like they have some ownership. So when you can establish those group agreements or those group norms together, you're really going to have a sense of empowering your group and, and making everyone feel like they really matter within the group. We also need to make sure that it's a safe and respectful place. Um, no, no news to anybody that once people started getting on social media, it was real easy to bully, kind of like driving 
and getting angry, so easy to just make some kind of a hand gesture or facial gesture or scream an epithet at somebody because you think you'll never see them again. They're in a car driving past you. The same kinds of things can happen. And we really want to make sure that folks feel safe and feel welcome to share, even if what they're sharing seems a little like, oh, really, you think that? We want to make a place where they can. So these are the examples that we have come up with, how we run our virtual groups. Definitely, we want to maintain confidentiality, and we're going to talk more about what that looks like in a virtual world. The start and end times are so important for people. Um, fortunately, for webinars and trainings, things like this particular event, we can record them, um, and people can have access to them later. You cannot do that with a support group. But it's very important to honor the time of people that have set aside that slot. So if someone is going to come late, that's great. You come on in late, but we're not going to stop and wait for you, right? Um, within this kind of a group setting, those side conversations may not happen as much as they would if we were all sitting in a circle. You know, you might not have to sit in between two people and keep them separated. Um, but still, there can be side conversations through the chat box. Um, you want to think about what are you typing in the chat box? Who did you send it to? Did you mean to send it to your best friend and you sent it to everyone? Are you going to be hiding your head in shame later? I mean, we've all made those mistakes, right? Um, we do know for sure that there are so many different family configurations and availability. Barb's going to talk a lot about the different times and times of day and days of the week. Um, that NACAC has used to really make their support group um, network continue to thrive and still meet the needs of different people. And we really have to think about the fact that we cannot judge one another. One of the most dangerous things that can happen in a group is if, um, and usually as more experienced um, families have judgments about what some of the newer families are doing, what that will do is it will make those families stop talking. And if they're not telling us what they're challenged with, there's no way that we can help them with those challenges. So we really want to have a place where people feel welcome and not judge. I'm sure you all have used some other um, types of group agreements. Are there others that we have not mentioned that you might want to type into the question box? This is for all of us to learn from each other. Another thing to um, know too is that we do at NACAC, we have um, we have several different samples or examples of some of the group agreements that different groups around um, the United States have used that we can share with you. So if that's ever something that you're interested in, you can email us and we can get that to you. Britt, did we have any questions or yes. ideas? Um, yeah, before you move on, Kim, I wanted to um, ask, there's a question from Adam asking about establishing a group purpose, and if that's mm -hmm. something that you guys have any guidance on. Oh, absolutely, you want to do something around that. And I'm going to turn it over to Barb because that's one of the things she's really skilled at. Yes, and so that's that kind of is going to depend again on what kind of a group it is, right? Is this just a general group about adoption support or is it does it have a specific focus for example are we going to be focusing on parenting teenagers or parenting school age children or um, special needs or medically complex or whatever it is and so that's definitely something at the beginning that you want to work with the group to figure out um, and sometimes what we see for a lot of places when they're first starting out groups is that um, maybe it's just kind of a general adoptive fostering kinship family group. And um, as it starts to grow, um, sometimes that's when it makes sense to break off into those different ones. So definitely establishing if we're just a general place um, for you know families, parents, caregivers to come together and talk about specific things and you know, like to determine that with your group. And then if if and maybe at the beginning it makes sense to have it have a specific focus but um and sometimes it's regional you know it's location geography based um you know i lead some on fetal alcohol spectrum disorders that are specific to that and some of the challenges we can have or enjoys with that as well so um yeah definitely that's a that's an excellent thing to be doing at the beginning um of the group to make sure that everybody knows why they're coming and and you know what's going on with that 
Absolutely. And one of the other things that people will think about as well is, do we want our group to be a place where we can just have community and network? Or is this also a place to learn? Do we want to include training in what we're doing? Yeah. If we are including training, and I highly recommend making those opportunities available to people, um, you want to be sure that you, as much as possible, can set aside some time just for that community building and that networking between parents. Oftentimes, as adoptive parents, we, we kind of just want a verification that we're not completely nuts, or at least if we are completely nuts, it's in an okay way, and it's and it's understandable. So. I would recommend highly that you never give up all of the networking for training, but certainly do talk to your families and find out. I've also been um, recently been doing some training myself that's week to week. And it's a really cool thing to be able to give people some assignments during the um, end of a session, perhaps, so that people get prepared for the next one or a book club or things like that. We do want to talk about some absolute rules that we think are essential when you're doing online support groups. So number one is you, you cannot be doing any recording or screenshots. And that's really to support people's confidentiality and say, you know, feeling of safety. I can come to this group online. I know that what I say is going to stay in the group and it's going to be respected. Very important as well, though, to use headphones if you've got kids around or other people in the house, because we don't want them hearing someone else's story. That's not fair, really, to the child that might hear it or to the person who's telling it. Um, as well, and I think this is one that people sometimes forget, and I, I've been on some trainings when it's happened, you're sitting with your child on your lap as a parent trying to get that support you need and you're talking about the child's issue while they're sitting on your lap. It is not gonna work out for kids. It is gonna be very uncomfortable for them. It's gonna cause a lot of questions. And one of the things that I would suggest, and Barb would be the person to lead this for you, is for people that have kids that are gonna be around, you may wanna think about having a night owl group when they can talk freely, when they can talk openly, without having to worry about their children hearing what is happening. Um, and wondering, is mom talking about me? Is dad talking about me? Or is that lady that I hear talking about me and how does she know, right? <laughs> so think about those things as well to keep your kids feeling okay. Um, this is a slide that you could use for your group agreements. And if this is something that you wanna just copy and paste from your, um, PowerPoint that you've got, please do that, that's fine. What we will generally do is have this agreement slide as the first slide that comes up when people are logging in so that they can remember. When we're doing the in-person um, groups, we often will have the group agreements on a page that also includes our attendance. So that as people sign in that they're here, they're also agreeing to the group agreements, if you will. Um, and it's easier that way if something is going awry, we can just kind of gently remind people, oh, remember, um, we were talking about confidentiality. So sure, uh, we'd love to hear about that idea that you have, please don't use names. You know, we're a small community. Somebody might know who you're talking about. And so just to remind folks, definitely each time you meet, Remind people of what the agreements are, make sure that they are visible to folks, um, and make sure that people understand that they are agreeing to that confidentiality by virtue of participating in the group. And with that, Barb, I'm gonna throw it to you. Thank you. Okay, so you know, there's a variety of um, different types of support groups that you can have. As I was mentioning, it can just be a general discussion group. Um, kind of on any topics related to, you know, adoptive foster and kinship families. Um, but as Kim was saying too, it could be have a tra having a training focus. And I know several people um, are talking about that they're struggling with engagement and participation. And um, I just um, was working with um, a group in Nebraska a few weeks ago. I had a meeting with um, a group of staff who were leading some support groups and we were brainstorming how to get their attendance up. And that was one of my suggestions was to have um, get a couple of speakers or local, you know, local people on different topics. Maybe it's on guardianship. Um, you know, if you've 
Um, like I, one of the support groups I lead is the parents of teenagers. And so that's a topic that comes up frequently in that group. And so we brought in a speaker who talked about guardianship um, when they became adults, if that, you know, and again, not all of our kids need that, but there are going to be some of them who likely need that. And, um, and this person also was able to talk about special needs trusts and SSI and different things like that. So sometimes having a speaker on a common topic that's coming up in the group or whatever, most of the time you can find free local resources who will do that. Um, and, and as Kim was saying, if it's an hour and a half support group, I would have maybe the speaker for 45 minutes or something like that. Um, so that again, the important thing is, is that you're leaving that time for the networking and the support to happen. And so using, um, you know, using some things like that to kind of um, bring the, um, you know, get the audience back in and back engaged is um, a really good way to get that going. It's also something that, um, in, in many areas is going to be a draw too, because if we have families that need like hours, training hours for licensing, um, that's another big draw and a way to get them in. I know that in some states and territories that um, uh, they will actually count a certain percentage of the hours that a family needs for licensing as um, attending support group hours. So that's another thing that um, if, if that's not a policy that you have in your organization or agency, um, maybe that would be something to talk about. And I can't remember, I feel like it's, you know, maybe 20% of the hours that they need or something like that is what I've seen in a couple of different states. Um, another thing is curriculum focused, and we are going to be sharing um, a Google Drive with you guys um, that is, has a whole bunch of different resources that any of you guys can use at any point. And there are a couple of different curriculums um, in that that are things you can use. And, and in some ways, it's like it's almost like a, a book club. Um, one of them is based on the wounded. Oh, no, I always get it, wounded children, healing hearts. I never can remember it immediately. Wounded mm -hmm. Children, Healing Homes by Jane Schooler and a number of other authors. That's it. Yep. So like that's one of the that's one of like the kind of the a book club almost or a training. A, curriculum focused thing that you could use over a certain week in a certain period of time as something. Um, and so that, you know, and I've seen other groups just doing it with different books, whether it's, you know, like Ross Green's The Explosive Child. I mean, it doesn't have to be a resource that we're sharing with you, although there are a couple of different ones that we have um, that you can use, but sometimes it's just a book that's um, a good book right now, like Beyond Behaviors by Dr. Mona um, Della Hook is a really good one for families who are trying to figure out how to parent differently and things like that. So those can be um, really great resources that can get kind of people showing up. And, and, um, and again, if we're doing even a book club or a curriculum thing like that, we wouldn't want the entire time for session, the, the entire time, whether it's an hour and a half or a two hour, we usually think um, an hour and a half is a really good amount of time for a virtual group. Um, two hours can get pretty long. Um, in person, sometimes two hours work great and you can take a break in the middle or something, but an hour and a half has really been the sweet spot that we've found for virtual groups. Now, if it works to do two hours or one hour, that's fine too. And what, what I've done, even in some of the groups here in Minnesota that I've led, is if, it, if, if on any particular day or evening, it's a smaller group, um, I don't sit and try to drag it out to an hour and a half if we're feeling like we're done at closer to an hour, then um, we'll kind of just wrap it up. So um, there's lots of ways to kind of look at that and how, how we want to do that. Um, so the format of the group, again, there's, there's multiple ways that you can do this to, um, to kind of engage different uh, participation in it. So it can just be kind of a general discussion going around the you know, the Brady's, Brady Bunch group of video cameras that you can see and um, having everybody introduce themselves, say their name, where they live, make up of their family. And um, one of the challenges that we that we have with in-person groups and virtual groups is sometimes those introduc introductions can overtake the meeting. And when it gets to, you know, the third the third parent's turn, they start just spilling and sharing whatever struggles or excitement that they're dealing with right now. And all of a sudden we're 30 minutes into the meeting and we haven't even gotten around 
the group yet. So one of the one of the ways that I get around that um, in many groups is when I start it off and I say we're going to go around, say your name, where you live, uh, makeup of your family, because it is you know it's we don't go around to the grocery store and introduce you know if somebody asks us how many kids we have we don't say well I have two adopted kids and two bio kids. But in a support group, the context of being aware of if there's a combination of bio kids, adopted kids, foster kids, things like that is kind of, it is important to the context of the group. So some, so we will talk about that. But what I will say often is, um, and just kind of, I'll just be feeling the mood of the group out or like how this group has been going. We, I might also have everybody say if there's a question or a topic that they want us to talk about tonight. And so I'll say, you throw it out there, I'm going to write it down and I will come back to it. Um, and so we're not going to talk about it during the introductions, but I'll come back to it. I do that when I do in-person groups too, especially if they're somewhat of a large group. Um, if it's a small group, if you only have two to four or maybe five people, you might not need to do that kind of as formally structured like that. But for the larger groups, I do that. And I had a group last week that met um, and I had 12 parents that um, were in this group. And that's kind of actually a really nice number. Um, eight to 12 is kind of the sweet spot for groups, um, group size in my opinion. Um, but sometimes the larger ones can even go great as well. Um, and uh, the smaller ones, you know, they're awesome too, but eight to 12 is the sweet spot. And I, you know, we went around and I had people, um, you know, say if there was um, a topic or, you know, something like that. They also, I also threw in a kind of a fun thing. Like I want you to talk about um, a favorite childhood smell. Um, you know, a fragrance or something like that, that was um, a positive thing that you remember smelling, something like that. So that's what we did. And I'm looking at my attendance from that and the notes I took. And, um, you know, it was, it's always interesting to look, one, one parent had a question about <laughs> how to get a harassment order of protection because they knew another parent six months ago had to do something like that. Um, somebody else was talking about they're actually looking at adopting a teenager right now and they're, they're in the collaterals and they were asking the group, how, how did you figure out if it was the right fit or not? Um, and then somebody else was asking questions about RTCs, residential treatment centers. Um, so um, then what I do when I actually, after the introductions are over, I take the notes, I write down those topics or questions. And then um, I will then come back and say, okay, Kim, let's talk about your question about residential treatment centers now, and we'll talk about it. And then I'll say, okay, um, all right, Joe, let's talk now about your question about the collateral meetings. And what I do sometimes too, is sometimes some of those questions or topics are really heavy <laughs> and, um, and emotionally charged um, topics. And some of them aren't as much. One parent was trying to figure out last week how, um, you know, her um, her son is staying in a different state with his other mother, um, uh, they're divorced. And sh her question was like something about like how to deal with medical appointments across state lines or something. So that's not a super emotionally charged thing. So we, I just jumped around from heavy to light is what I usually recommend because otherwise if it starts to be too deep and too heavy, um, we don't want people getting depressed. So there's just all these different kind of great ways like that, that you can kind of keep um, keep the conversation rolling and um, having some topics like that. In my groups where I use that format, um, I, what I have seen for in-person and virtual, the parents come prepared. Like one of the moms last week is, I have a twofold question. I'm dating somebody and they're struggling with the way that I parent my son. Um, because they're thinking I should do consequence based, you know, so she had two different questions and um, and it was clear that she knew what they were when she entered the, ju the group and wanted to talk about them. So um, that's a really good sign that things are are going well if we're doing that. Another thing too, though, is if it's a group that isn't super established and comfortable with each other yet, um, one of the things that we've noticed um, with the different groups we've worked with around the country is that um, groups that were meeting in person that then transitioned to virtual because of COVID, um, that those groups tended to have better attendance because there was already some cohesiveness amongst the group. And um, some of just like the new, just here's a virtual group that anybody can join. Um, those ones have struggled a little bit more to kind of take off. 
And so um, what I've done in some of those groups is I've had a few different um, topics or questions that I've got set up beforehand in case there isn't conversation or talking or different things like that going on. So um, it's always kind of smart to be prepared for, you know, those, those kind of potential things. All right, um, variety of groups, as Kim was saying, that in Minnesota here, I, did, I need to look and count. I think we have over 30 for sure virtual support groups going um, on a monthly basis. Um, one of my favorites, and I am a night owl, um, Kim is an early bird, so like Kim would lead an early bird morning group, maybe that's 8 a.m., anything earlier than that I think is just brutal and nasty, but some of you guys like getting up early. Um, but night owl groups, I've been leading some that meet at 9 p.m., we've tried 8, we've tried 8.30 p.m., 9 p.m. has kind of been... Um, the sweet spot is, you know, actually, and I've even done some 10 p.m. groups and both the 9 and the 10 p.m. groups have had pretty good attendance. And so um, those are those are some things to kind of look at. Um, again, having a specific focus on um, and maybe it's a specific focus on the caregivers, meaning maybe it's for kinship parents, um, caregivers, maybe it has a focus on LGBTQA plus, you know, maybe it's a mom's group, maybe it's a dad's group. Um, different focuses like that. We have a dads group that's meeting um, weekly here, and I think that they're averaging about seven dads in that group, which is um, which is a great um, you know a great attendance for that. Um, and then again, specific topics, as I said, um, FASD, parenting teens, um, transracial families. Um, I have one that meets tonight at 8 p.m. that focuses on out of home placements just helping um, parents and caregivers navigate that if their child is in out of home, whether it's in patients in the hospital, whether it's a residential treatment or a group home or crisis home or whatever it is. Um, and just about every month when I lead that group, I'll have a couple of different new parents who have joined who have a child in a crisis placement and are navigating some of that. Um, so those can be uh, really helpful to have a, just a variety of different groups that are meeting. And another thing that can really work too sometimes um, is doing what we would call a pop-up support group. And um, that's, that's in particular really easy to do if you have a Facebook support group network. And so um, here in Minnesota, we have a, um, NACAC has a department called the Adoptive Foster Kinship Connection. And we have a contract with the state of Minnesota's Department of Human Services to provide support for adoptive families. And, um, and we've got a Facebook support group page that has over 2,500 members. So I, every once in a while, just kind of, in, and most of these I've done in the middle of the day, I'll just get on Facebook and say, hey, come to this link. I'm leading a group right now if anybody needs to join, you know. And, um, and it's not like there's 20 people that join, but I have definitely have had, you know, like four to six or seven people that have joined in on them. And every time I do that, they were like, they're always like, oh, my God, I was so excited when I saw that you were doing this because I'm having a really hard day. Or, or something like that. One of them was a grandma, uh, a grandmother, a kinship caregiver who was sitting in her car in a parking lot, um, emotionally struggling when I posted this pop-up group. Um, and so, um, so those can be um, really fun to do as well. Barb, we have a question if you um, have a moment about um, if you'd recommend keeping groups uh, like closed to the same group of participants or if you have open groups or if you have recommendations around that. Yeah. So I would say that would be on a case by case, um, you know, kind of model. What's hard is if you had a group that was meeting in person that was kind of an established group. Um, it can almost sometimes feel clicky because um, a couple of mine were like that. My parents of teen group, for example, we've been, that group has been meeting for years and is very bonded and, um, you know, and uh, really enjoy each other. And when other parents, new parents um, have tried to join in on that, it's, you know, I've had to be really intentional to pull them in. And um, and my and my group members are too, but I have definitely noticed that some of the parents just don't feel quite, you know, 
like it felt as as the way that they wanted it to. So what I usually do then is I'll reach out to those parents afterwards individually, or I've actually even had them stay on late. I'll say, hey, Amanda, you know, the person who showed up for the first time, who, um, and, and sometimes there are people I've never met and have never heard of, um, but the, I'll say, hey, can you stay on late? You know, I'm so happy to meet you. I'd like to just chat with you for a few minutes. So everybody else will leave and then I'll just stay on and say, hey, how was that, you know, and I'll actually tell them, this group's been meeting for years, so I just want to make sure that you don't feel like an outsider. We're totally glad you're here, keep coming. Um, if it didn't feel right to you though, let's talk because here's this group and this group and this group that might be a better fit for you. Um, you know, so, and we do have some groups that we actually keep closed in particular, some of our transracial family programming stuff. Those actually are a bit more educational than, um, than support focused. And some of those groups um, have been, you know, meeting for years and going through different, um, you know, topics and curriculum or at a, at a certain point in their journey of um, understanding um, how to be anti-racist and that kind of stuff. So for a new person to come in, who maybe isn't as far along, that doesn't work. So some groups, it makes sense to kind of have it be closed and some it doesn't. We had a bunch of regional groups that met um, all over the state of Minnesota, whether it was like Northwest Minnesota or the Brainerd Lakes area or whatever, the, or you know, the East Metro and the Twin Cities. And um, those groups we've actually kept, um, not all of them, some of the groups like, you know, the Fairmont group, they weren't interested in doing virtual, but um, those groups are kind of specific geographical ones. So that's worked well. Awesome, thank you so much for that. And with that, I'm gonna segue us here with another poll question for y'all. Um, so I'm going to launch that. For those of you who have done uh, virtual support groups before, what platforms have you used? And you can check all that apply on this poll question. Um, and so I know a lot of folks are using Zoom. We're on GoToWebinar right now, so you maybe you've used GoToMeeting or GoToTraining. All, I know my kids are on Google Meets all the time. And then um, Facebook Live, uh, specifically, of course, within a private Facebook group would be, that would be a, a, definitely a necessity there. But I have heard of some folks doing that. Um, and for those of you that are marking other, I would love to hear again in the, in the questions pod, I'll voice some out um, if you would mind sharing what platforms you're using. Obviously, we are limited in the number of options we can give here with this poll. Um, so I'll just give folks another second here. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close it and share. Yeah, makes sense. I'm sure that that Barb and Kim are not surprised to learn a lot of folks are using Zoom. Um, for those of you that are using other, a lot of people using WebEx, Microsoft Teams. Very good, very good. I'm surprised that many people are using that for that type of um, support group. So that's awesome to hear. Um, and not too many using Facebook. That's not surprising not surprising me either. All right, I'll go ahead and hide these and y'all keep on going. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to talk some more about online support groups. And now this is for us as leaders to think about, right? We want to practice beforehand. So I can tell you, I'd mentioned earlier that we had a four-day virtual conference. We probably spent almost as much time practicing with all of the presenters as the conference itself was. But that's super important because I think one of the fastest ways to lose your audience is when you look like you don't know what's going on. You know, they don't feel like they're in good hands. They're not gonna be looking forward to spending an hour, an hour and a half um, and, sh and bearing their soul unless they feel like they are in good hands. So you really wanna do that. We recommend finding somebody, a friend or a partner, or even if you're doing a, um, a two-person support group leading style, practice with one another. Make sure you understand how your technical stuff works. Also make sure you feel comfortable as you're doing your presentation. Um, the more that you do that, the less you're gonna be doing the ums and ahs and wondering you know, what's next. Um, Definitely you want to make sure that anybody that's going to attend the session knows what to do if they're having trouble, right? If you freeze, log out, come back in. We'll be letting, we'll be watching for you. We'll let you right in. If you can't hear, check to make sure that your microphone is on. Check to make sure that if no one's listening to you, have you muted yourself? You know, some of those things that we just don't think about. 
when we're on a virtual platform. As um, a leader, you wanna make sure you have paper and pencil ready to take notes. I know myself, I'm constantly saying, oh, that is so important, I'll never forget it. And within 30 seconds, it's gone. So everything that is gonna be important, you wanna keep notes. Barb has this wonderful way of keeping a book with her all the time. So she can even go back and see what we talked about the last time or look for trends and see, you know, who's really been struggling or is there a group that seems to really have a certain interest? Maybe we want to have a spinoff group that will just meet that interest, but it really does help. Certainly you want to start with introductions and in an in-person meeting, this is important. In a virtual platform, it is essential that you make an opportunity for everyone who has shown up to be able to speak at least once within the first five to 10 minutes. Even if it's just to introduce, say their name, who their kids are, maybe they'll pose a question or maybe they won't. But if you haven't spoken and a lot of time goes by, it's gonna be really hard for you to speak up. So make sure you engage people right away. Um, you wanna think about, especially again in a virtual setting, to have a smaller group size um, and, and expect that there will be less participation, but you can really be creative about how to get that, that participation up. You'll notice Britt has made sure that we have polls every once in a while. That will engage people. You wanna make sure that you ask people to respond in the chat box. Again, that's gonna help engage them in what's going on. Um, and certainly one of the, this goes back to your confidentiality and group norms, do not post the links in public spaces. Really good way for people to troll and hop in that should not be there. So and we're gonna, you know, what, yeah. I'm just gonna jump in, Kim, and add something. With yeah. some of the, um, one, one of the things like here in Minnesota that we did um, when we were transitioning to doing all of our groups virtually um, is I did a practice set, I sat and practiced myself on Zoom figuring it out and I had like, I made my husband, two of my teenagers and one of my friends all join me in a Zoom group and I just sat and practiced and played around with it. And um, I did that like several times and was taking notes and all of that until I got comfortable with it. And then I did that, I did that with um, all of our staff in Minnesota who lead support here. Um, but we also have some parents, um, we also have some parents who we give a little stipend for to lead groups as well. And so I did that practice session with all of them too until they felt comfortable. Um, and then another thing that I've done with some of my parents or caregivers who I know are not as comfortable with technology, um, when I've been trying to encourage them to join a group, I've actually said, would you like to log on 15 minutes early or 30 minutes early and I'll join in with you and help you figure out the technical aspects of it? And um, and several people would say, no, no, thanks. I think I can figure it out. But there was um, many who really liked that option. And so that's another thing that it's not a huge um, you know, time sucker or anything like that, but it is something that can really help some people who struggle with technology. And what beautiful examples, Barb, because that's what we're here for, right? We're supporting our families. Um, and if it takes a little bit extra to make sure we're successful, that's great. Yep. So these are some of the questions that Barb will use for introductions as um, preparing for the, for the group. And again, you know, really thinking very clearly about how you ask the question. Name one positive thing that has come out of the current health crisis. Isn't that a great way to get people to start changing their mindset, right? Let's start with something positive. I know for our family, we had a baby born in December and uh, not mine, my grandchild. Um, but it was a wonderful time for that baby to have two parents that were completely devoted to her for the first, so far, nine months of her life. She, I've never seen a kid that's so well attached, but there's a positive. And I think it really helps people to kind of reframe themselves. Um, they're coming to the support group because they're not feeling so hot a lot of the time and we wanna reset that. What's an activity that your family loves to do together? Again, a really nice way to reset, to think about things we might've forgotten to do. I know when my kids were growing up, one of the favorite things that they loved to do was to have an indoor picnic for dinner. And we would have all picnic food and would lay out a blanket in the middle of the floor and maybe watch a movie or whatever. But it was a way to take something that's difficult, being quarantined, being confined, 
and make, you know, make lemons, uh, lemonade out of lemons. Um, and then what self-care have you practiced lately? Um, I know that we have a lot of professionals that are on the um, webinar right now, and many of you may or may not also be foster adoptive parents. One thing I wanna say about this whole self-care question is that for a lot of us foster adoptive and guardianship families, the idea that we have to come up with some time for self-care feels like one more thing to do that we don't have time for. So remember and remind your families that sometimes self-care can just be as simple as saying, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that right now. Um, it doesn't always have to be something that you add on. It can be something that you take away. So just thinking about how do we put those questions out there and get people to think creatively. Yeah, and sometimes if I have a family that's on that cannot think of one thing that, you know, that they've been able to do, I'm like, well, you know what, being in this group right now is self-care. Absolutely. But I want you to think in the next month about some even more <laughs> other things that you can do that are, you know, for yourself. Perfect. Another few questions that you can think about. If somebody wrote a book about your life, what would the title be? I cannot imagine what funny titles can come out of a question like that. And boy, there's nothing better for our families than to get them laughing. So what a great way to do that. What animal would you choose to be and why? Again, getting people to think about their imagination again, right? Go back to that childhood kind of person. And what's a childhood memory that makes you smile? I will say about things like a childhood memory, for some of your families that may be triggering. Um, if you know who's in your group, think about which of the questions are gonna be helpful and which of the questions might be triggering. Um, and over time, we do get to know our families and get to know them pretty well. Before you guys move on, we had a question around um, how do you, in a virtual setting, maybe, um, you know, politely interrupt or, or help, you know, if, if somebody's really going long, especially in those introductions that Barb was talking about, how do you politely corral somebody in this setting? Here, here's what I do. I, I start waving. <laughs> and then I start laughing and I'll be like, oh, Kim, oh my gosh, you got a lot of good stuff tonight, but we got to move on. Um, but you know what, if there's, if, you know, and then I'll say, if it's something that's, you know, if it's just a really tough story or whatever it is, that I'll say, let's let's you and I connect later on and stuff, but we got to make sure everybody has time tonight. But it's just great. You just sit and start waving and smiling and and just, you know, kind of do this polite interruption like that. And um, it's actually, I have found in so many ways, it's much easier to facilitate support groups online than it is in person because it's harder for people to do those side conversations that Kim was talking about. Um, it's a little, it's, a, it's actually, it doesn't feel as personally invasive to interrupt somebody by just starting to wave and smile than it would if you're all sitting in a circle and you're waving at them or something like that. So um, I'll just kind of start smiling and, and, you know, do something where they're seeing my camera and, and they get the cue that and they need to stop talking. And I'll say a lot of people that have a tendency to start talking too much, they kind of know that about themselves. You know, and so most of the time aren't offended when we do that. Barbara, right. it makes me think of something. Do you um, do you ask people if they have a camera to use the camera so everybody can see each other? Because I we know. Do, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So um, there's definitely been some groups where people have phoned in, you know, and um, and so. Uh, and especially if it's somebody that we know when we know that it's them that has worked out okay. But um, for the most part, I really try to challenge people to be in person on the camera. And, you know, not, not everybody is um, enjoys being on the camera. You know, we had a big discussion for this webinar about if we were going to keep our webcams on for you guys or not, because it's much easier not to. But um, but we 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 know as when we've participated in trainings, it's actually helpful to be able to see the face of who's talking, and so so it's not the Wizard of Oz kind of a moment, right? So um, so I will encourage people to put the camera on, and um, most of them are fine with doing that. And sometimes it's a parent who's driving or who's sitting in the car at soccer practice or something like that and um and then you know if it's somebody we know there have been a couple of different times though where we've had 
um, where we've had like, it'll just say Galaxy Note 5 or something in the box instead of a person's you know, image. And so that's clearly somebody that's on their phone. But, um, but when I, there's been a couple of different times where I've been saying, okay, Galaxy Note 5, I don't know what your name is, but um, can you introduce yourself or tell us who you are? And then it's just silence. And I'm like, I'm not sure if you're muted or not, you know, and I'll give them a couple of prompts. And then I'll say, if you don't, if you're not able to sh tell me who you are right now, I'm going to have to remove you. And I'm so sorry if this is, if you were meant to be here email me and let's figure out the technical issues. But there's been a couple of times where I've had to remove, um, you know, random things like that, that weren't, you know, that we couldn't, and I'm sure more than likely it was somebody with a technical issue, mm -hmm. but yeah. I'm glad to hear you say that though, because it would be, um, it would be pretty scary to have someone on there that doesn't belong. And I suppose yeah. if all else fails, we do have the power as the leaders to hit the mute button. Mm -hmm. Probably not the best way to build relationships, but if we have to, we do. <laughs> yes, that that that's very true. So, Barb, this is off to you now. You want me to do this? Okay. So, um, you know, I can't remember now what the percentage was, but it was something like 70 or 80% were using Zoom, right? Yeah, um, close to 80. Yeah. And... Um, Ideally, you know, if we could have done this in Zoom, it would have been better because then I can sit and I can actually do some practicing with you guys, which is um, the ideal way of doing this. But um, but we're not able to do this today in Zoom for multitude of reasons. So a couple of just different things that can be helpful. Um, again, when you have people that are joining Zoom meetings that are not very tech savvy, um, sometimes you just have to make sure that they know that they can click on gallery view to be able to see the whole Brady Bunch looking thing, that's what we always joke and say it feels like, um, and as opposed to the speaker view. So on the gallery view, that's on the left, the speaker view is on the right. Most people prefer the gallery view, but it's totally up to them, right? Um, and so that's something that we can let them know. Another thing too, is that um, when you're leading groups on Zoom in particular, you, can, you will know if somebody is on their computer or, or on a tablet or phone because if they're on a computer like right now where you get where you guys see Kim and I's faces are the entire box is full of our video feed right and um, if you had somebody um, on your that was in your group that was either on their phone or on a tablet you would see it would be a gray box like between there would be gray on each side of my face filling out that green square where I think it's green um, and so it's just a little skinny shot of their face um, so that's just a clue to you that you'll know that they're on their phone or tablet and most of the time if they're on their phone or tablet especially if they're newer to joining groups um, you know on zoom or whatever platform they might not know that if they just take their phone and swipe like oh you can see my emails if they just take their phone and swipe they will be able to see a split screen of four other people who are on and if they keep swiping and you know depending on how many people are in the group they, they'll be able to see that because I've been sitting there with with families who are on and they're like they don't real, you know, they don't realize that all they can see for the most part is, you know, whoever the speaker is that's speaking in that moment. And then when I tell them that, they're sitting there and they're like, oh, there you are. And they're like, hi, Kim. And they start saying, you know, and so sometimes it's just helpful to let them know that um, so that, you know, they're they're feeling more a part of the group because um, it does help for them to be able to see. I I I, I love doing these virtual support groups since I can't do it in person. I would way rather do it in person because I'm an extreme extrovert. So this um, pandemic has been challenging for my mental health. But I tell you, um, having being able to see some of these families whom I um, adore virtually even and just seeing their faces um, can bring me a lot of peace sometimes. Um, but another thing too, and and I've actually experienced that with one of my group leaders here in Minnesota is it's important for you guys just to always know if you're facilitating the meeting, you have the power to mute people. And so, so, cause you know, we've all heard of all these crazy things that have happened on Zoom, whether it's a child in the background throwing some F-bombs or whatever the thing is that's going on. Um, and sometimes, you know, sometimes the parents uh, all of a sudden they're so entrenched with whatever is going on in the background that they forget they should mute themselves before they deal with that situation, whatever it is. 
you have the power to mute people. So don't forget about that because we had a situation where the facilitator forgot that and there was a whole bunch of inappropriate language. And it did happen to be our group that was for our um, uh, adolescents. <laughs> so that was unfortunate. Um, we're, we, we live and learn a lot, right? Um, another thing too, and I know that there was a question in um, during the registration of, about like a really large group, right? What a great problem to have, 70 people or something like that in a group. I love those kind of problems. Those are my most favorite problems in the world because that's a sign that you're doing something really right. Um, and But it is pretty hard to have an actual support group with 70 people in it. And so um, another thing that when you're practicing using Zoom or whatever platform it is, I don't know if they all um, do breakout rooms as smoothly as Zoom. What we've really found um, through using the various platforms is that Zoom has definitely been the most user friendly. Um, and so one of the things that you can do though is you can split participants out into break, breakout rooms. And um, I've done that even where I'm just leading a group one evening, it was one of my night owl groups and I had a, um, a kind of newer mom who has a couple of medically complex kids and then I had this really seasoned, really experienced um, uh, mom who has had you know, medically complex kids for years. And the, the younger one had all these questions about G-tubes and all of these different medical terms that the majority of us in the group knew nothing about. And so those two moms started this whole thing and the rest of us were sitting there like, well, this is boring. So I was like, hey, you know, hey, Sue and Anne, can I throw you guys into a breakout room and you guys can talk about this because I see huge value right now in the stuff you're talking about. This is really important. And they were talking about like in-home nursing companies, you know, they had so much to talk about and they were like, oh my gosh, yes. So I threw them into a breakout room, um, which again, you can, you can just Google that and there's a really slick YouTube video on how to do it. And again, just practice it. Um, and that can work. So that can be something that you have pre-set up, like if you know you're going to have 50 or 70 or whatever people, you can have it set up beforehand. Um, you can actually pop as the facilitators, the hosts, um, the hosts can actually pop into the different groups. It's really cool. It's a pretty slick um, way to do it. And when you when you do start a breakout room, you can either do it manually where you choose which people are going into which rooms, or you can just choose the automatic and Zoom kind of, they figured that out. So it's a, it's a pretty cool option. All right, is that me still? Um, I'll go with it. Another thing you can do is you can do um, polling. That's something um, you would more than, it's easier if you do it ahead of time before you would have a group, but just like Britt's been having you guys do a few different polls tonight, that's another th another way just to get people involved and maybe it's there's something specific that you want to know that's going to be helpful for your programming for a grants that you're writing or maybe it's just something to get a topic flowing or get people's juices flowing things like that um, but there it's again it's another thing that's really easy to google um, and learn how to do it that was how I figured it out um, and just watched a brief little video that zoom has on their on their thing but um, all the platforms have the polling options, so that's kind of um, a nice thing also that can kind of boost um, boost involvement. Um, and then this is uh, one of the reasons why I wish that we were using Zoom today, but sharing your screen is so much easier in Zoom. And um, I've done that, like there was this, one of the groups I was leading, we were having this really hearty discussion about um, confabulation and if you don't know that term you need to know that term if you're working with adoptive foster or kinship families or children um, it's um, it's the whole thing where many of our kids who have a trauma history and their brains have been impaired by their trauma history whether in utero or out of utero um, struggle with lying and making up really goofy stories that make no sense it's actually called confabulation and it's a, a brain thing and there's this awesome video that um, by this man named Nate Sheets out of Oregon Behavioral Consultation and that is actually in the Google Drive it's one of the resources listed in there um, it's like a six or seven minute video and we had this one mom one night who was just so dead 
set against and mad at her child for all of the lying and a bunch of us in the group were trying to explain confabulation and there was several people who didn't know it and i'm like hey let's just watch this quick six minute video and i pulled it up on youtube i shared my screen and there it was and we had this amazing topic after that about um about lying which is we we try to reframe as confabulation definitely sometimes it's lying but um so anyways i've done that too where i've even just brought up photos or um little quotes or things like that with sharing the screen so that's another way to kind of boost engagement and keep things flowing these these are like some of the images that I've shared before. Um, like I love the one on the left, the I cannot control and what I can control. Again, one of one of our goals in all support groups needs to be um, first of all that parents are able to come and ask questions and get advice, um, feel supported, feel connected. But um, but one of my biggest goals is always to be helping our families understand how to parent these children differently who have trauma histories. And so um, so if we can have just little things like this that, you know, sometimes I might just put up that, that I cannot control um, box and start off the group like that, like, hey, let's talk about this tonight, you guys. What do you think when you see this? And we'll, we'll read through some of those. So um, these are all things that you can just Google and find on Facebook um, or email me and I can send some of them to you because I've got a ton of them in a folder. Um, those are these are things also that we put. I'll put um, some of these on our Facebook support page from time to time. So this is our Google Drive here. Um, we encourage all of the folks that come to any of our trainings to share any good resources they have on this Google Drive. Um, lots of great stuff there. One of the things that I'm pretty sure is there, but we should probably double check, Barb. We put together a really comprehensive um, list of tips and strategies while using Zoom or other remote platforms that dives really deep into a lot of these things. So please um, do take some time to go and look here, find some of these resources that we have, share others that you might have. Um, many of the things that we've referred to today, you're gonna find up there. Uh, and it's just constantly being added to, so a great way to get some new resources. I love this saying, and, and so important for us to remember that as the support group leader, we are the guide on the side, not the sage on the stage. And I think it's so important. I, I, I'm sure that all of us have been in that situation where we've been in a meeting um, or, or even a support group meeting where the person who's facilitating has made it all about them and has made it all about their expertise. And quite honestly, what happens when you have that kind of facilitation is that you, you first of all, are not really facilitating, you're orating. But the second thing is that it sets up this expectation with your members that you are an expert that they can never be. Um, and when we talk up to when we talk to people about a few different things, when we talk to them about sustainability of their groups, what we will find is that when you have a group that is led by the kind of strong leader that is in charge of everything, that's a group that will fizzle away if that leader is not able to keep up with it. No one thinks they can fill their shoes. The other thing is that it can often set people up for these unrealistic expectations about the kind of parent they should be. Um, and I know that both Barb and I have heard from families over time when we've shared struggles that we have or challenges that we have, that it's such a relief to hear that you have the same problems, right? It just makes a big difference. So remember that, remember to go into your groups with a sense of humility um, and with a sense that you're going to learn as well as teach. This is about the whole group learning together and sharing together. We want our attendees to feel welcome, respected, and values and, and valued. That's how we can maintain them coming back. And I think one of the things that can be very helpful in this, if you're not already, think about having a co-facilitator for your group. If your groups are being run by the agency or by the public department, um, that professional leader is gonna have an awful lot to share. They're gonna be a great resource. 
And if you bring in a co-facilitator or a co-leader who is a parent with lived experience, that is going to increase the amount of learning and the amount of feeling welcome, respected, and valued even more so. Because families already look to the professionals as the experts that they're trying to please, but to hear from another parent, to know that they've been through the same struggle makes it real. And it, and it really makes people kind of sit up and take notice and think, okay, so maybe I can do this. Maybe I, maybe I can be open and vulnerable in this group because there's someone leading that also is. Move forward. All right. And these are some of the characteristics that are so important. Um, this optimistic worldview, and when I think about an optimistic worldview, it's about the view that you have of your family in particular about our kids in general and about our families and their place in the world. So it's really multi-layered. I think right now in these times that we're living in with, you know, we have a pandemic, we have racial um, justice and injustice being spoken of, we've got political people being polarized on every side. Our families are coming to us for a sense of hopefulness. And we, as the leaders, are the people that should be in the role of holding hope for them when they can't hold it for themselves, right? We want to remain open-minded. We want to remain, um, I think, aware of the fact that one size doesn't fit all. So just because a strategy might have worked for me or it might have worked for Barb, it may not work for someone else. So always eliciting ideas from the rest of the group, knowing that one size won't fit all, knowing that different approaches are there because each one of those approaches has worked for somebody. We want to set a stage and set um, an example, really, of being self-aware and self-reflective. I often will tell the groups that I'm with when I'm doing training, when I'm doing support, um, and actually even when I'm parenting, that I only have ever really learned anything and learned it well by making a mistake first. If you happen to do it the right way first, it could be serendipity. You don't necessarily learn from that. Um, but we need leaders that are going to be humble, that are going to own their own stuff, and that are not going to be afraid to share that and set a model for self-reflection, self-forgiveness, and also learning from our mistakes. Um, really important that the leader is able to maintain regulation. Just as we talk about with our kids, that it's important to start with regulation, it's also to start with our group when we're trying to help other folks. If you dive into people's pain, if you dive into people's unhappiness and sit there with them, you're not doing anything to help them get out of that same place. Um, so please remember that. You're the person that's going to kind of lift people up. You can offer empathy. You can offer validation without climbing into the well, right? Um, we absolutely need to think about maintaining appropriate boundaries. And when you think about self-care, especially for the leader, very often those leaders that are burnt out, it's because they have not been able to maintain their boundaries. They give too much of themselves to too many people too often. Um, and one of the ways to go about that, again, is to look for co-leaders, to elevate people in the group that can step in, to put together buddy systems for folks like the, the two people that... Barb referred to that we're talking about some of the medically involved issues. You can do all kinds of great things to make sure that you're going to maintain your status as an effective leader. There's a lot that we have done over time around leadership skills. I know that Adopt US Kids has webinars um, to talk about those specific leadership skills that you want to develop. And I really encourage you um, as a new leader to look at those, but also as an ongoing leader, it's always great to get that refresher. And look to who your support system is. All of us need to have support in this work. None of us can do it on our own. And then finally, just think about the idea that you are the person that's going to help reframe. Um, one of my favorite things to do, actually, in a training is, is to have people like throw out the worst thing you have and let me take that worst thing and reframe it for you um, to see the positive in it, to see the benefit of it. And that's the role that you all can play because that reframing 
will give your members the ability to go back in there another day and fight the good fight. Over to you, my friend. All right. And um, setting a positive tone is huge, right? I, you guys have probably heard from parents before comments like, oh, I hate support groups. It's just a big, you know, grape session or um, different things like that. And so that's what is really, you know, there's hard stuff and that's got to be talked about. But we've got to make sure that, like Kim was saying, that we can help families to reframe it and um and kind of make it have a positive tone because nobody's going to continue coming if it's just a whole bunch of whining and complaining um without um ideas of how to help you know with solutions and um bringing hope and that kind of stuff um it's important that we engage everybody and then also we've got the um the nonverbal cues too and i i've actually found this is even easier to see on zoom or online when i'm leading a group you can sit and just look at all of the little squares in the cameras and be like okay they're starting to lose it or they're not paying attention or something like that so you can you're you're able to actually draw people in and it's just i'm i'm much more aware as i'm looking at all of the little cameras um, on there that are on my screen. Um, another thing, I'm, I'm gonna start going a little bit faster here because we're starting to run out of time. Conflict is normal. Um, everybody that attends a support group is not going to agree on everything and that that's okay. That often is a nice group norm to have set up at the beginning. Um, so just know there's no way we're gonna have support groups talking about some of this tough stuff without having a certain level of conflict. Um, and this is what I'm super passionate about is that we have to laugh at every meeting. We've got to have some levity, some fun, um, and some laughter as a part of each group. And um, uh, I actually have seen group leaders who have that ability have higher attendance in general. And so making sure that we're having fun um, and laughing is really important. One of my support group leaders here in Southern Minnesota, she's super fun. She actually, and we, the, another thing that as far as engagement and participation, um, we, a Facebook support group or an online support group um, is a huge strategy and tool to get parents um, immediate support, but also to get them connected and coming to support groups. So we will post it. I have found that on some of my night owl groups on nights that I don't get on our Facebook page an hour beforehand and just put a reminder with the link of we're having a group in, in one hour or 30 minutes or whatever it is. Um, when I don't do that, my attendance is not as high. And I always, when I put a reminder, I'll always have parents say to me, thanks for the reminder, you know, because Mm -hmm. um, we have one that's on Sunday nights at 9 p.m. and people and the families wanted that, but sometimes you just sat down after you got the kids in bed and you forget about it. So um, reminders um, are really important, but laughing is really important. So this group leader in Southern Minnesota, she posts a reminder on there and she does a bi-weekly group and she has like between 15 to 20 people in her group every month, every um, bi-weekly session. She puts a picture of her from the last group wearing some whatever hat she was wearing and she says, come on Thursday to see what hat I'm wearing this week. So she just has got all these goofy, <laughs> silly, you know, wacky hats that she wears. And I'm like, something like that is brilliant. I mean, like, I'm like, oh, Melissa, I want to steal that because I think that was so smart, you know. So just little things like that um, can really make a difference. I also will send out email reminders to some of my core groups. Um, and so if I have a new person who's come, I'll get their email and I'll write it down and I have some, I have different group emails. Um, and so like my parent of teen group, I sent them a reminder last week on email and they all told me last week that that's really important. And I should keep doing that because sometimes you feel like you're bogging people's down. But I started it out and I said, our pot group meets tomorrow night, P-O-T, and I put that in quotes. And then I said, get your head out of the gutter. That stands for parents of teens, you know? And then I said, anyways, people, they comment all the time to me on how much fun just little goofy things like that that I put in the emails to them um, how much they like that even so laughing is important um, again interrupt and redirect unrelenting storming so if we do have um, you know one of the participants who just keeps coming and keeps interrupting or keeps you know is just being um, you know is 
storming too much, um, we've got to stop that. And there's a couple of parents, and I've had to do that online. I've found that it's actually so much easier to do online. And I'll even sometimes send them a little message in the chat box personally. I won't send it to the whole group. I'll send it to that one parent saying, hey, I can see you really got a lot to say today. And but you know what, we want to make sure everybody has a chance. Okay, so you know, try to try to um, take a shorter amount of time whenever you have something to add, but please keep adding, you know, or something like that. Um, and so those things are important to keep in mind too. Um, and as Kim was saying earlier, balance in sharing is really important. Um, you know, it is important to lead the groups that, you know, um, and again, we forgot to put this in this PowerPoint, but I know that the vast majority of you guys who are on here today are professionals and maybe aren't an adoptive foster or kinship parent. Maybe you're both, right? But if you are um, just a professional, you're fabulous, we need you, but I highly, we highly recommend that you find a parent to partner with in leading these groups because that's another thing that we found is that they are much more effective um, if they are either co-facilitated with a parent and a professional or led solely by um, a parent or two. Um, and so um, that's gonna help. But anyways, it's important that we also share some of our struggles. And so I just had to do that a week or two ago on our Facebook page. I put something that I'm struggling with greatly with one of my kids. And, um, and there was two different people who commented saying, it's actually really helpful to hear that you leaders have some struggles too, you know? So um, otherwise we can come off looking um, uh, perfect, which I usually am. No, I'm not. <laughs> Really kidding. Um, learn local resources too. Like that's one of the biggest things. And if you have parents or volunteers um, or you know people who maybe aren't as entrenched in the child welfare system as some of you professionals are, um, making sure that we're all aware of what those local resources are. I mean, and what all of those goofy acronyms mean, mean and that kind of stuff. That's a really common thing that we talk about in support groups. So yeah, we did talk a bit about you know bringing laughter in, breaking tension, and finding humor in in tough situations. There's a story that I tell about one of my kiddos who um, struggled with brain injury from fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, yeah. and he he had stolen my car. Oh gosh, I don't even know how many times, and then get caught trying to. G.I. Joe crawl into the bedroom with the keys in his mouth in the middle of the night so he could put them back, get caught by his dad. The two of them ended up rolling on the floor laughing hysterically rather than turning it into a big fight because it was so dumb. And two weeks later, when I was sick in bed with the flu, the same kid asked me for a ride to his friend's house. I said, I can't even believe you're asking me that. And his response was, well, I didn't want to bother you. I would have just taken the car, but I don't know where you hide the keys these days. I mean, that's a funny story, right? It could have been a disaster, but it's not. So we really, one of the things that we can do for our families when we do have a parent co-facilitator, we can bring in some of these experiences that a traditional family, right, would have thought, oh my God, this kid needs to go to reform school. We know in ours, it's not quite the same. So we, we do set that example. We definitely want to remind people, and, and here's a place where I do think for professionals leading groups, you are at greater risk than, than we parents are. Make sure your families know that this is not a therapy session. Um, you're happy to try to send them some referrals, but when things get tough, when you can see that what's really going on is that they need some counseling, they need some professional help, you know, talk to them outside of the session. Acknowledge that whatever it is that they're going through is big, it's hard, um, and you have their back as their support group leader, but really what they need at this moment in time is to have some professional help. What'll happen otherwise is that the rest of your members are not getting what they need, um, and you are not getting what you need either. Another some ideas that Barb has put together for how to keep the flow going. Um, what do we have planned for the holidays, for summer, for breaks to keep our kids busy? Now more than ever, our families want to hear these ideas from each other. Um, what's the best thing someone outside your family has done to help your family out? I really like this one. I wish, I wish that uh, 
I had heard it before, yeah. but what a great way to inspire our families and neighbors to try to help one another, right? When yeah. was the last time you were alone in your house? And that that might be a triggering one for some of our families, but. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the things we wanted to make sure we share with you guys is that at NACAC, um, Kim and I and some of our colleagues are available for training. Um, we We've done so many virtual trainings this summer for various states or organizations or territories on um, on how to lead support groups and like we're really passionate about some of the things that need to be included in that obviously today we're just talking about virtual groups and how to do that but normally when we do a training um, we're talking about so we make sure fetal alcohol is in, um, involved in that training because any support buddy leading a support group for adoptive foster families is that's going to be a topic that comes up. Um, we talk about trauma-informed parenting strategies we train on. We train on parent engagement, how to get parents coming. We train on how to facilitate the group. Um, we mm -hmm. talk about birth family connections, kinship stuff. Um, so that's stuff that we are totally open to and you can reach out to us if you're interested um, in uh, any kind of training or things like that. We also can do, um, uh, you know, throughout the end of this year, we can do what's called technical assistance. If you just wanna set up a phone call or a meeting with us or a Zoom call to talk through some different things that you might be struggling with, um, we are happy to help you get this stuff going because we believe that um, post-adoption support and parent support groups are um, crucial to, um, you know, keeping disruptions low but there, it's also helpful for recruitment. And I know many of you guys are probably struggling with that, but if we are not supporting our current foster adoptive and kinship families, the word gets out mm -hmm. and, um, and it makes it harder to recruit new families. And so um, doing this kind of stuff is going to um, have big payouts in the end. So with that, we'll hand it off to Britt. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. I'm going to spend eight of that on questions. Y'all had some awesome questions, tons of questions coming in, and I know we're not going to be able to get to all of them, and that's why um, we put some of the um, links um, in the chat about where you can find other resources from Adopt US Kids. Um, Barb and Kim, if y'all are okay with it, I'm going to um, put your emails in the chat as well so that folks can reach out to you guys directly. Um, we had some questions around um, uh, how to encourage folks to use their webcam when folks are resistant to using their webcam. Is that like a rule that you require or like how do you encourage that? Um, what I've done is I've tried to, generally what I try to do is I've tried to have um, Kind of some you know a, a private conversation in a way with the with whoever it is that's struggling with that um just to say that you know a support group is really an intimate thing right it's very intimate it's um we're talking about some of our deepest most challenging things and some of our deepest most challenging joys and um to do that to be supportive we need to be able to see each other and know that um, people are paying attention and that kind of stuff. So if we just, if you kind of frame it like that on that, it's pretty hard to be supportive when you can't even see the person. And yeah. also I just keep, I, I just am reminding people, we're all desperate right now for human contract, contact, even the extreme introverts, right? Are mm -hmm. losing it. So um, uh, that, you know, so I'll just use phrases like that to help encourage them. And most of them get it when you point that out. And I also say, and none of us give two hoots if you're wearing your pajamas or your hair looks like crap, right? Um, so, you know, I'll just, you know, we'll say that kind of stuff too in a supportive way, because that, that comes down to it a lot. That's why people don't want their cameras on. Barb, I was right. thinking about your friend with the hat. You could even make it as you're trying to break the ice with people make it some kind of a contest like whoever's got the goofiest yes. outfit yeah, or yep and you can do show and tell we've done that in some of our groups too we've done show and tell like hey why don't you go grab something that's really helped get you through this you know the the lockdown in the spring or you know something like that and and um you know things like that so yeah it's really helpful thank you I, we had another question and you you mentioned um we're talking about really sensitive things, really complex things, and people can get emotional in groups. And mm -hmm. in a you know, virtual setting, we don't have the opportunity to like put a hand on someone's back if they're you mm -hmm. know getting emotional or starting yeah. to get upset. Yeah. Um, how do you handle those type of situations? 
we've done virtual hugs. We'll be like, oh, like literally we've done that. And I'm like, oh, Kim, I wish I could put my arms around you right now. I, I feel that pain. Oh my God, you must be, you know, you, that's got to be so hard. And, um, you know, so we've done things like that. Um, and, and other group members have done that too. And um, the other thing that I've done is if there is somebody who, um, you know, was if it was really emotional for, you know, however many people it was, I usually I write that down in my notes. And Kim said, you know, I have um, I have my handy dandy notebook that has all of my support groups in it, it has all of my to do lists, all that stuff. But um, I'll write that down in my notes for that meeting after under where I've written who attended. I'll write down, oh, Kim and Britt, we're really struggling tonight, follow up with them, you know, and sometimes I do it immediately depending on, you know, what I was sensing. And again, it's one of those things sometimes where I'll say, hey, Britt, you want to stay on just you and I when the group ends tonight? We, I, I got some time we can do that for 15 minutes or whatever, and I'll touch base with them. Are you offering? Because, yeah. yeah, no, I'll stay on right now. <laughs> no, I'll stay on <laughs> The other thing, too, that I will mention, and Barb did that beautifully with the two moms that were talking about medically fragile kids, especially in this time, if you can establish a group norm with your members that they don't mind partnering up for some more one-on-one -on -one kind of support, it's a great way to expand what mm -hmm. your group can offer to your members. Yeah, I do that all the time. I have this whole list of core families that have given me permission I don't have to go to them every time and say, hey, I have a family who have a kid sitting inpatient at the Mayo Clinic right now. And, you know, and I know that you've had that before. Can I connect them with you? Um, and I have these families have said, anytime, just give my info. You don't have to ask me, you know, and I mean, I, I don't spread it, put it in public or anything, but um, I will. Con and so I'll say that if I see somebody really struggling in a meeting. I'll say, hey, Britt, would it feel good for you if I was able to connect you outside of the group today with a parent who has been on a similar journey? None of them are identical completely, but would you like that? And most, they almost always say, oh my gosh, yes, please. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, you, you've touched on this, but I just, I think it was worth reiterating. Um, uh, there were some questions around, are there non-negotiable um, group agreements, especially related to virtual settings, or they're like online etiquette that like must be adhered to, or, or you know, or are there things that is always up to the group, or do sometimes you say, no, we're gonna do X? Yeah, the non-negotiables non are the fact that we don't record them ever, that we do not take screenshots or photos of the screen, and, um, and that, again, if there are other people around that you have headphones on. Those are the non-negotiables. Um, uh, and so most of the others are negotiable, but most people agree on, you know, it's kind of those basic ones. Right. That's great. And as I said, we had a lot of questions that maybe aren't as related to the topic today, but um, I thought this would, was worth asking if you have suggestions for somebody who's starting a group now about a first topic, a way to engage folks initially in, in, a, in a group when you can't meet together in person when your first group is going to be virtual. Yeah, I, what I would do then is I would have a list of some prepared topics or questions of um, ways to help the group to get to know each other better and, you know, and kind of just like go around and, you know, start with, okay, let's, you know, let's talk about um, what was the most helpful piece of training that you went through in your journey to adopt or foster and, um, and have people go around and, you know, and so some different things like that that can just get kind of people sharing and understanding things that were like, oh my God, yeah, I loved it when that speaker was at the training, or this one was really boring or whatever, you know, whatever it is, um, and people can start having things that they connect on and can relate on. Um, but to have, I would have multiple different things, you know, different questions set up and just kind of go through and use your gut of which one you go to next. To and keep actually, it if you have access to someone that can guide this, or if you are competent in guiding this conversation right now I bet you would get hundreds of parents that would jump on if you had a first meeting about how to be a parent and a teacher in a virtual school <laughs> yes yeah yep that's so true yeah I'll join <laughs> I know right 
<laughs> where do I sign up? <laughs> um, so with that, I know we can't get to everybody's questions. I do want to make sure everybody knows that NACAC, of course, has a ton of resources for parent group leaders. Adopt US Kids also has developed a lot of resources for parent group leaders, and I put the link there in the chat. Um, I, um, If you would move us ahead, Barb, so that folks okay. can see. No, you're good. Um, I'll just close this out here because I want to be respectful of everybody's time, mindful of time. Um, so Adopt US Kids, um, as a, um, a project of the Children's Bureau, we offer capacity building services, publications, webinars, and tools for, and we have specifically have tools for parent group leaders, and all of that is available um, for free. I want to make sure that I mention that because we're federally funded, um, so that's not a not a sales pitch or anything, um, and you can find all of that um, that is at that link that's right there, and I put it in the chat box as well, um, and on the next slide, you'll see um, my contact info. Again, my name is Britt Cloudsdale. I'm the Family Support Program Manager for Adopt US Kids. Kids, um, and that is my email address and my phone number. Um, I um, am, I can put anybody in touch with Barb and Kim if you would like to be in touch um, about other um, services that they could offer to your support group. Um, and then also, if you need any assistance or if you if your jurisdiction has need, you can contact consultation at adoptuskids.org um, to contact us about capacity building services. And I would definitely encourage you if this type of um, resource is something that you're into, and I appreciate appreciate all of y'all staying on this whole time. Fantastic turnout, fantastic engagement. I would definitely recommend if you're not already um, to sign up for Adopt US Kids emails and you can um, get ones that are specifically tailored to um, your um, interests. Um, and uh, I'll also say as we close out here, please, please, pretty please um, uh, respond to our evaluation survey that's coming in your email momentarily. It's again coming from Adopt US Kids evaluation. Um, if if this is something that you um, are liking, if this is something that you're not liking, if you have other ideas, other topics that would be of interest to you, we want to hear about it. We want to make sure that we're only giving you the stuff that is actually meeting your needs, and we can only do that if we hear back from you. So with that, thank you so much, Barb Clark and Kim Stevens of the North American Council on Adoptable Children. We greatly appreciate you guys lending your expertise to us, and um, you all have a great rest of your day. Y'all take care. Bye. Bye.